autonomous vehicles, hands-free driving, full self-driving, robo-taxis. You've heard all these terms used before from different automakers. It's getting difficult to compare the levels of technology that each one has to offer. Fortunately, the Society of Automotive Engineers has put together a not at all complex scale by which we can rate the different systems by. It's called J3016, Levels of Self-Driving Automation. And fortunately, it's widely accepted within the auto industry. Even marketing and communications people are starting to pick up on it and use it when announcing new products. In this video, I wanna walk through that scale, give examples from each of the different levels, and to see where the best technologies lie today and where they'll be in the not too distant future. So let's get weird with J3016. I'm gonna walk through the different levels of driving automation and give examples of systems that meet the requirements. There's rarely any consistent naming for features. Engineers like consistent naming and they love acronyms. So all these different features fall into the general category of ADAS, Advanced Driver Assistance Systems. Before diving into the nerdy details of autonomy, I did wanna point out the serious nature behind all this. In the US, after decades of improving road safety with safer cars and increased use of seatbelts, we're starting to see a disturbing trend. Fatalities on US roads have gotten worse, not better. And it's very much unique to the US, not just drivers getting killed and their passengers, but increased deaths and injuries to pedestrians and cyclists. There are a number of theories as to why. The leading explanations are changes in driving during the COVID lockdowns. With less traffic, some people decided to start driving like assholes, killing themselves and others. And now that things are back to normal, there's some indication that fatalities are leveling off. Increased availability of recreational marijuana and increased abuse of alcohol. And also distracted driving. Everyone has a smartphone, everyone has social media, more streaming music through their phone. I like to kid around in these videos, but I'll put a link in the notes to a very powerful video on the dangers of distracted driving. It's not gory, but it is sad and very impactful. And I encourage you to share it with any young drivers you may know, or any driver regardless of age to really bring home the importance of not being distracted while driving. Level zero. A vehicle classified as SAE level zero of driving automation has features that can issue warnings and momentarily intervene, but it has no ability for sustained vehicle control. There are lots of systems that fall into this SAE level zero category, a backup camera warns you visibly, backup sensors warn you audibly, lane departure warnings, it uses a camera to see lines on the road. If you come close to crossing that line, it will set a chime or vibrate the seat. Forward collision warning, also called forward collision warning assist, it typically uses a combination of forward looking radar, which can see further down the road, and a camera to sense if a crash is likely that's just a warning, so it's SAE level zero. Better systems will have active brake assist or automatic emergency braking. With this system, if the vehicle believes a crash is likely, it will begin to apply the brakes. But again, that's a momentary action, so it's still level zero. Level one. With SAE level one, the driver is still responsible for the act of driving. The system is capable of taking over limited acts of driving from the driver under a limited set of conditions. The key statement here is that level one systems can provide prolonged support for steering or braking acceleration, but not both at the same time. Cruise control is the most common level one system that's been around for years. It helps a driver with regulating speed over extended periods of driving. The driver is steering, the driver is responsible for braking to disengage a system, it's clear the driver is still responsible. That's a basic form of cruise control. An adaptive cruise control system will adjust the speed if there is a slower vehicle ahead that it detects. That's better, but it's still SAE level one. It's just doing a better job of regulating speed. The vehicle may have a lane keep assist or lane keeping assist system 
rather than just warning you that you're crossing into the next lane, it will actively try to nudge you back to center. What you end up with is sometimes called a ping pong effect where the car is bouncing off the lane markers. A more advanced version of this is called lane centering. It continuously acts to keep the vehicle centered in the lane, not just bouncing off the lines. This type of a system can handle sharper turns. I'll talk about lane centering in the next section. That's SAE level one. The driver is absolutely responsible and the system helps with steering or acceleration slash braking, but not both at the same time. Level two. The key to a vehicle achieving level two or partial automation is that it needs to be capable of continuously regulating speed and continuously steering the vehicle to stay within its lane. What's an example? Tesla Autopilot is an SAE level two system. Now I'm proud of myself. It's been minutes into this video and this is the first time I'm explicitly mentioning Tesla. If you're not familiar with Tesla's driver assistance systems, a quick summary. Autopilot, it's a misleading name, but that's what they call it. It's now standard on all Teslas. Enhanced Autopilot adds some additional features. Then there's Elon's wet dream of FSD, full self-driving, which I will discuss later. Spoiler alert, it's a misleading name too. Tesla Autopilot was released late in 2014. It's an SAE level two system because it regulates speed and it keeps the vehicle centered in the lane, lane centering. The final requirement is that the driver is still ultimately in control. And this is where Tesla went a little crazy. Early Teslas with Autopilot did little to monitor the driver and people took advantage of them. You had people jumping in the back seat, falling asleep behind the wheel, and in one well-documented case, a driver was killed while watching a movie. Tesla software was updated to better sense if somebody had their hands on the steering wheel. Then people figured out a way to cheat that feature too with weights. Newer Teslas have a driver-facing camera to make sure the driver is at least somewhat paying attention. I don't like being told what to do. But sometimes you need to restrict what technology can do so that people don't do stupid things. Who offers a level two system? Just about every automaker has some version of adaptive cruise control and lane centering that works together. Feed off the pedals, but even though the vehicle has lane centering itself, you need to keep your hands on the wheel because you are the driver responsible for the vehicle. Bonus round. In 2018 at the Consumer Electronics Show, Mobileye, then part of Intel, introduced a new term for the system they and others were working towards, Level 2 Plus. It's a more advanced Level 2 system, but not quite Level 3. Mobileye was the original system supplier to Tesla for Autopilot. Now Tesla has developed their own hardware and software. The key benefit of a Level 2 Plus system is hands-free driving under certain driving conditions. Level two systems allow the driver to take their feet off the pedals. Level two plus systems allow the driver to also take their hands off the wheel. The person behind the wheel is still responsible for the vehicle. They are still the driver, ready to resume control at any minute. There are two key achievements that make level two plus possible. One, the system has enhanced capability to maintain lane centering. Many automakers, not named Tesla, use a high precision map and precise GPS location to keep the vehicle centered in the lane, even when lane markings are not the best for the camera to see. These high definition maps can place the vehicle within a few inches. That's more accurate than the maps we use for navigation. And two, since a driver still needs to be responsible for the vehicle, legally and otherwise, automakers require advanced sensing systems to make sure the driver was paying attention. This is no small task. To make driver monitoring work, engineers had to study lots of human behavior to understand when they are looking away for too long or when they are getting drowsy. And it's not easy to see people's eyes with glasses or sunglasses on. And at night, an infrared camera is required. My understanding of all the driver monitoring systems is that the images of the driver are processed on board. They do not get sent to the data center. So 
Don't worry, a picture of you picking your nose while driving will not end up online. But but you should you should probably stop that. It's kind of gross. Before moving on to the other levels, I wanted to introduce a key concept. ODD is a collection of conditions that must be met for an automated driving system to operate. It allows the engineers to determine if they want the level two plus system to operate in severe weather, if they want to allow it to work in construction zones. Today, most level two plus systems are limited to interstate use only, but what about lesser freeways or major arteries? Can the system operate on a ramp that connects two highways together? These are all constraints that go into the ODD. All of the operational design conditions must be met for the system to operate, and that can cause it to disengage during the drive. All the systems I'm aware of, except Tesla, rely on that HD map to precisely know the road ahead. If the road you want to travel hasn't been mapped in HD, you can't use the system. That's why automakers post maps online showing what interstates are currently available for level two plus driving. This explains why many of the systems have a subscription fee. Yes, they want to nickel and dime you, but that monthly fee also pays for the HD map to get streamed to the vehicle and to get updated so that it has the absolute latest information on the road ahead, every curve, every lane, down to a couple of inches. Level five. Whoa, 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 time out. What happened to level three and four? I decided in this video, I'm gonna jump ahead to level five and explain that and then work backwards to level three. That's because level five and level four are kind of straightforward and easy to explain. Level three, on the other hand, is a little more complex and somewhat controversial. Level five is easy. The system can drive the vehicle under all conditions. The driver does not need to take over. Essentially, the person sitting in the left front seat is a rider. That's a term that often gets used by some experts. The driver becomes a rider in a level five system. If the vehicle gets in an accident, the vehicle is responsible. That's how most laws are interpreting this technology. You could simply say that there is no ODD, no conditions that must be met for the system to function. But in reality, there are some things to consider. Unpaved roads like this are named or numbered so they should be allowed, but if the rider requests the vehicle to go down a trail like this or across an open field, that would be outside of the operational domain. Land Rover and Jeep have shown concepts for how they could enable off-road full autonomy, but they're just concepts at this time. Really cool though. Questions will be raised about, do you allow the rider to command the vehicle to exceed the speed limit? And if so, by how much? If a level five vehicle is being used as a robo taxi, you could choose not to install a steering wheel, but for practical reasons, having some means of a human operating the vehicle seems likely, at least at first, there are zero level five vehicles available today. You can't buy one. There are none on test. Tesla FSD isn't even close. Level four. All the vehicles being tested today have some degree of ODD, some conditions and limitations on where and under what conditions they can operate. There are several companies permitted by the state of California DMV to operate driverless test vehicles. They include Waymo, part of Alphabet, Cruise, part of GM, and Zooks, part of Amazon. They all meet the requirement of a level four system. The human in the vehicle is a rider, not a driver, when the level four system is active. The human is never asked to take control of the vehicle. It will stop itself if it cannot continue. That's because it operates under a limited set of conditions, the ODD. In San Francisco, companies love to test because it's near Silicon Valley and it's a potential market for robo taxis. However, you cannot jump in and command the level four vehicle to take you to Vegas like the Oakland A's ownership wants to do. There are lots of other design constraints currently in place to try and prevent issues, and yet there are still issues. It's clear that the developers of self-driving technology underestimated the complexity of human driving. It's taking much longer for computers to figure out what every human knows how to do. Do you know how to fucking drive? No. What? 
No, I don't know how to fucking drive. I don't know what any of this shit is, and I'm fucking scared. Level three? Right now, for level three automated driving, there are very, very, very few vehicles you can buy that offer it, and neither of them are a Tesla. What can a level three system do? Going back to the chart, it can regulate acceleration and braking, feed off the pedals, it can maintain lane centering, hands off the wheel. But unlike a level two plus system I talked about earlier, when a level three system is engaged, it is responsible for driving. This allows the driver to relax, have something to drink, watch a video, or do other stupid things. How does it work? Most systems aspiring to go from level two plus to level three have a LIDAR sensor. That stands for light detection and ranging. They create these cool digital images of the surroundings for the computer to interpret. Mercedes has a LIDAR sensor. Volvo will have a LIDAR sensor mounted at the top of the windshield. Kia will have a LIDAR sensor mounted in the bumper. The Chinese company Xpong is putting them low towards the ground too. Neo, another Chinese EV maker, is putting them up high at the top of the windshield. Expect to see more premium vehicles, not named Tesla, to be equipped with LiDAR sensors. Even if they're not at level three yet, they are planning ahead for future software releases. This sounds great, but for the first system from Mercedes, there are some significant ODD conditions and restrictions. First of all, it's limited to 40 miles per hour in the US or 60 kilometers per hour in Germany. That sucks, but fortunately this is not a technical limitation. It's largely a regulatory limitation as we are in the early days of approval. Expect to see this limit raised in the future. At that low speed for now, it's really only good for traffic jam assist on highways and in certain conditions. Engineers don't want to be responsible for driving on wet roads, so the Mercedes has a moisture sensor in the wheel wells to tell the system when to disengage. It senses road debris. If it does that, it's going to ask the driver to take control. Mercedes Drive Pilot relaxes the driver monitoring when level three is engaged, but it doesn't totally turn off. It will make sure you don't nod off or close your eyes. This is why earlier I described level three autonomous driving as controversial. It's that one box on the SAE chart that shows that the vehicle is in control of driving until it's not. And that's when the rider is asked to resume their responsibility as the driver again. That raises a lot of questions and concerns about how that's gonna happen. The Mercedes drive pilot system and others being proposed still monitor the human rider behind the wheel. They need to make sure that they are there and are ready to resume control of the vehicle in some reasonable amount of time. I put reasonable in air quotes. Engineers don't like this uncertainty. Lawyers don't like this uncertainty. And the owners of these vehicles, yeah. If the rider still doesn't respond, they've thought of that too. Most systems will autonomously steer itself to the side of the road and come to a complete stop and put the hazards on. All these problems go away with level four and five. With those system, there is no handoff back and forth between the human and the system. So level three is kind of complicated for only a little bit of benefit. As I'm making this video, Tesla's full self-driving is only level two. Mercedes and Honda have level three systems, although other automakers have already announced plans for their systems in the upcoming months. And level four, you have Cruise, Waymo, and Zooks operating test vehicles in the United States. In other parts of the world, China and Europe, there may be other players also operating test vehicles. And I wouldn't count Tesla out of this race yet. If there's one thing they're really good at, it's taking risks and expanding the envelope on technology. So we'll have to see what they come out with in the months to come. I expect that they will release a hands-free version of FSD probably sometime in 2023. And anyway, those are the levels of SAE driving automation that are widely accepted within the industry. I hope you found this video informative. If so, give it a like and consider subscribing. Thank you for watching.